design, got this. Who told you? Who told you? Who told you? Who told you? You are God design, God design. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining for our first episode of Borbo Breeders TV. And we're happy to have you here. You took some time out of your day. We're going to get into some facts. We're going to get straight into the facts. I'm going to tell you all about how we started our dog breeding, how we became interested in the African borbles. And we're going to talk about why we do what we do and anything that you guys want to talk about. This is, We love the borbos and... We're going to get straight into it. Then we're going to give you all 100,000% facts. We're going to keep it positive, motivating, and uplifting, um, true to form. It's all about the facts. And so let's kick it off. We're going to start off with how we chose our dogs. So before you get started with any particular dog, you want to do some research on the actual breed. We chose the South African Borbos. They have a lot of traits and characteristics that we find appealing. And let's show you this dog. One of my favorite uh, dogs. This dog really motivated me. It's an important dog. And um, I felt that if I was going to have a dog, this was the dog for me. Here you go. That's the dog. That's a Vonter Anton. So this dog really got me started. And if you look at the dog, he's chiseled up. He's muscle. He's got the muscle. Yeah, look at the definition. Look at his head. I mean, he's got a lot of uh, really appealing features. This is why... This is the dog that led me into this South African Borbo breed. And it's not so much that he's uh, 200 pounds or I don't know how big this dog was, but I'm looking at the physique. He looks like he's serious, athletic, muscle, mus musculature, muscled, well muscled. I mean, that is a very impressive dog. And, um, I like to take my dogs and run them. I've been doing that since I was a little boy. I would like, you know, my dog to be chiseled and ripped up, muscled up. So this was the dog. What I did now, in order to find out, in order, how do I get a dog like this? I started looking at a lot of different borbles, but if you go to some of my other videos with African borbles, you're going to see a lot of different looks. So I didn't want the different looks. I wanted something very specific. I didn't want to just have a borble. I wanted to have a borble that looked like this. This is the, this is, this is the, the look, the picture that I've been chasing. I would like to take a picture of a borble, one of my borbles with a physique like that. And that's, that's, the, that's my goal. If y'all want to know why exotic borbles exist, it's because this dog right here was just show-stopping and stunning. So how do we get to this dog? How do we find this dog out? Or who, who is he? That's a Vonter Anton. So I found out who his parents were. Now, in order to get a dog like him, many people would say, I'm going to go and get a puppy off of that dog and I can understand how a person would think like that but that's not how we arrive at that dog how we arrive at that dog is we go to his parents so if you're looking to produce dogs like him if you're looking to have dogs that look like him you need to go to his mom and dad. And that's where our pedigree research comes in. So I had to find out more about this dog. Uh, so I found out who his parents were. Of 
Korma Bucks. And then his mom is Avanter Pauline. So I decided to go and find out if I could get a dog from Korma Bucks. Come to find out, Korma Bucks was no longer in existence. And um, so let's see here. I'm gonna, here he is. Uh oh. That's not the um, one that I want you to see, though. That's candy. Anyway, that's going to be easy to find. Cormel Bucks. Because. And this is the pedigree database. I go here. Well, I used to go here often. And then we'll go to the. So this is Cormel Bucks. And at the time, a 80 was the highest score that you could have 80 percent the appraisal score so this dog was regarded as perfect he had the highest score if you see 80 um he was heavily used and featured in some programs and uh, if you look at this is a great tool the pedigree of the borbles john doe shout out to john doe the guy that put this together this now contains 54,429 dogs african borbles I remember when it only had six or seven thousand borbles at the time and this is just really grown in the last uh seven 18 20 years or so when i first started looking doing my research so this dog was really popular he was said to be a perfect dog but more important than his score we're looking at the dogs that he produced like i said 80 was the highest score of that time and you can go through and this is when i really was took uh, appraisal scores into consideration you know they meant a lot more to me now well then than they do now uh, as i learned more about the what appraisal score was but if you look at these look at these different okay are y'all seeing what i'm seeing is you seeing that it's a drop down menu okay you can't see that but i'll show you a couple of his sons cabaret klein bucks is another a notorious uh producer he's going to be in a lot of the pedigrees that you find interesting um he's the father of the cabaret bloodline that's the son of cabaret uh Corma bucks we can go to um i mean there's so many dogs that this dog is responsible for producing how was he bred so uh this is something that you need to consider if you look at his pedigree, you're going to see that he has a pretty diverse pedigree. OK, so how was this dog created? He was created. Was he created from a tight line breeding or was it um, selectively bred to certain dogs with certain traits and characteristics? Based and uh, they pick dogs based on that. I like this dog. And then this dog has this common feature that I like so I'm going to breed towards this feature how was he selected as a specimen for breeding all we take on all of this into consideration how was he how was he bred and if you look at his pedigree it's pretty diverse you don't see a whole lot of the same names being repeated and you can go uh, I really like this too you can go back and you can also see how was his mom bred how did they come up with this uh you know who, and then you can also go in looking at some of his siblings, which I also felt that that was uh, pretty significant. You know, the fact that you can go and look at siblings and I take all of that into consideration before I chose this dog and this in particular bloodline. I'm looking at the sisters, the father, the mother. What went into creating this dog? Here goes another really nice dog that uh, I found another specimen of Korma Bucks. They use this dog, Nina. And uh, let's take a look at Nina. Nina produced some really, uh, I mean, Madala. He's also in our pedigree. And how are these dogs coming together? I'm just kind of getting familiar with the names, Ronard Martins. This is when I first began my research. So I'm getting familiar with these different dogs. Who is Ronard Martins? It seemed like he was highly regarded. He got a pretty high score. And that's, you know, 
based off of what I'm seeing, I'm measuring the scores. I thought that they meant a whole lot uh, towards the actual quality of the dog. As I got deeper involved with the organizations, I learned that's not so much the case, but it is an indicator of the dog's a visual appeal. So, and then you looking at the dogs that this guy produced. So not only remember, did he produce our favorite dog, Anton, he also went in and produced, this is Anton's half brother, Dominic, same father, different mothers. So we're going to consider all of that. I said, well, this is a, this is a dog that I definitely would like to have in my pedigree. I wasn't able to obtain a Corma Bucks direct uh, son uh, or uh, offsprings directly off of Corma Bucks. So I went and uh, I mean, you know, I was a young man, young er man, and I was very excited, you know, to share this with the world that I had came up with this dog and I felt like he was something special. I'll show you the dog that I first imported. Uh, his name is Pluto. Let's get Pluto up there. There you go. Hold on, I'm going to get him. My, I got a picture for you that you can really see uh, Pluto. And let's see if that'll come up. So that's Pluto right there. Same picture, but it's a little bigger. And this dog was only 106 pounds. This is him at 11 months old. You look at the pedigree, you'll see that he has uh, cabaret client books mentioned two times. Let me take this down. You'll see in uh, right here, I'm right here on this line. Cabaret Klein Bucks, and then we see Cabaret Klein Bucks again. So this is a line breeding on that Dopper dog that I had, uh, Korma Bucks. We got his son mentioned two times in the pedigree. So the likelihood of producing or, or reproducing his genetic value is higher. We're going to take into consideration. Now, this dog is was really important. Let me show you this dog. We really liked it. Uh, this cat. We really liked her sister, Cabaret. Let's see here. Give me one second. So I wasn't able to get secure uh, Dopper or Corma Bucks um, direct son or daughter. Okay, he was old. I was able to secure. Pluto, and I looked at, uh, okay, so here we go, I was able, my, my breeder that I originally chose to breed with, to, uh, well, to purchase my dog from, he had this dog, 217 Tosca, and she is a stunning female. I mean, I like a lot of the traits that I'm seeing from her. It's a Korma Bucks granddaughter, which would be a Vontor Anton niece. And I'm looking at her physique, and I'm like, this is an impressive dog. I don't really go so much for the size because size can be misleading. Bigger is not always better. I like to go for what I know that is capable. I'm looking for capabilities. Remember, I'm looking for a dog that I can keep up, that can keep up with me on a bike. So this dog, Tosca, I wrote to my breeder. I let him know that this was the type of dog and style that I was interested in. He said, check back with me in nine, ten months. Um, he, her daughter or her niece, which is lindy was having the puppies and uh, this is the five this is the pluto's mom so i went back and did some more research and i learned about this dog vander vigil tosca another corma bucks granddaughter and then I, I i learned about i mean these dogs are foundation dogs for other kennels that they built their entire breeding programs off of and because of that in my mind 
what's registering is breeding value, cap capability to produce, fertility. These things are going to be fundamental in having longevity and producing healthy dogs. We want to be fair to the animals. So the dog should be able to live a pain-free life. And I looked at a lot of different purebred dogs and it just something didn't sit right. I visited a lot of different purebred dog breeders and it seemed that the dogs didn't have that vigor. They didn't have that rustic feel. They didn't have that. It's hard to say. They, they didn't seem as robust. A lot of the dogs were kind of watered down or they were just. Remember, I did a lot of my homework and research with dog magazines. I looked at a lot of dog magazines. So. You know, I was looking for, I, I was visualizing, you know, a premier version of a Rottweiler when I go to visit a breeder. I have already a concept of what I believe that the dog should look like. So when I arrive at your facility for breeding or yard or kennel or I have an idea. Hold on one moment. Sorry about that. Yeah, I have an idea of what the dog should look like. As, But when you get there, the dogs don't represent. So, Borbos, on the other hand, I mean, they, they, they seem like relatively pure uh, powerhouses, still retain their workability. They had a lot of really appealing features, reminded me of a bulldog, but not as popular. And they were just more impressive. I decided that this is the breed for me. This is the dog that I would like to have. Long story short, I import Pluto and he's like stunning. Okay. I get my dog from my breeder. After 10 months, I'm so excited. It was like my whole, it, the day is finally here. Imagine going to this man's website every single day for 10 months straight, waiting, looking, reading the information. I kind of settled on him. I'll go to his website. He's not even involved in breeding anymore, but his website was, it was loaded with information, you know, uh, not just about sales. He's got information about nutrition, training, choosing your borble, borbles in children. He got information about, you know, the illnesses that affect the breed. And I thought that it was valuable. I mean, it, it was worth visiting every single day. And I'll even show you. They still have Pluto on here. I just checked the site the other day, and they still got the same picture of Pluto from back in the day. You can get my words. This is what I wrote back in 2009 about my dog, or seven or eight or something like that. I say, you can read that for yourself if you can see that. I said, it's been great owning this magnificent borble Pluto. He went and got the uh, SAP BT appraisal. He got took home the Merit Award. Got eighty three percent at only eleven months. We were so proud of Pluto. Even though he was only one hundred and six pounds, look at the physique on the dog. You can see very clearly he's well defined. Even at that time, I was still trying to get that picture. That perfect picture with all the muscles. And I fed my dog the best foods, I, you know, as recommended by the breeder. And here he, here he is. So I see a little split in my boy's ear. So Pluto was an outstanding dog. I said, I got to get more dogs like him. And 
I started seeking a mate for my boy. And that's what I came up with this female. Um, I actually, funny thing about Dopper Greet was I was inquiring about purchasing a puppy from her. Okay. And funny story. The person that imported the dog, my good buddy, Mike, he says, man, I got this new dog in. He's uh, He goes to mount her up and she just collapses. You can have her. You can buy her, you know. And then I, when I got the news on the phone, I left that day, like in two hours, went straight down there, got the dog came back home and then Pluto jumped up on her and bred her in the driveway. Now, um, it was before she was able to get appraised. So that was like, oh no, I thought I was going to be in trouble. How am I going to get paperwork? I got to get this dog scored up. But it really wasn't an oh no moment, but it was kind of like I had jumped the gun. So I had to get ready but why did I choose this dog? Remember, we talked about how is the dog bred, okay? That was a good, a strong consideration. That was something very important to take into consideration. So we got here is Renard Harry, which was the full brother of Renard Martins. And Harry doesn't have the same production history as Martins, but... We can go through uh, his pedigree, and you'll see. This was another. Look at this dog. That's a son of Martins, Dopper Darko. I thought that was a beautiful dog, one of the best dogs. I mean, I, that was that was going to be the dog for me. Uh, so, I mean, I I hadn't seen many borbles of this quality. How did how was he produced from Martins over Nandy? which is a dopper, a Corma Bucks daughter. So anytime that I would see Martins, Corma Bucks, and the pedigree with this type of lineup, I figured that that would be something that would be worthy of owning. And take notes of the females. So you got some really highly notable females in this pedigree, Dopper Darko. So we got Renard Harry as the father, which is the full brother to Martins. They say, come out the same belly. Marna, which was, we just looked at the breeding from Darko. Darko is the same breeding as Marna. So we would have a we have a on the mother's side, we got a Dopper Darko, which was that beautiful dog, niece, bred to a Martin's brother. And then if you look at this pedigree of Gritchie, they have her picture on the website. You'll see she is tightly line bred, Corma Bucks over a Martin's daughter over that same. Corma, which is would be a Corma Bucks over his granddaughter. Wow. Now, in coming from working dog background, where line breeding is something that is highly regarded, it's a form of inbreeding. But when working dogs, we are quantifying the dog's ability, whether it be a hunt or a uh, digging and when you're quantifying abilities you're testing the function so you're going to weed out any dogs that don't have the ability right with pedigree dog breeding and purebred dog breeding and showbred show dog breeding it's the uh, people are trying to the goal is to lock in a certain type and be able to reproduce that with some consistency. So as a novice, 
I was kind of torn. I needed some counsel. I would like, you know, I had to seek out some elders. I wanted to find out what would be the best school of thought to pursue. Now, because this is a larger bred dog, we don't really have a way to quantify other than an appraisal system, the dog's true ability to perform. And through history, I had already known that that was how working, the dogs that I figured that were appealing to myself, that is how they were traditionally selected. Uh, some examples might be like the Dogo Argentina, the Bully Cutter, the Pit Bull Terrier, American Pit Bull Terrier, or the American, the Bulldog. So in my early days, I thought that the line breeding, well, these particular foundation dogs, the line breeding, it did carry some weight. I knew with a, some certainty that I would be able to produce more dogs consistency consistently like their ancestors. I knew that based off the pedigrees, based off of the productions of the other breeders. And I could also, it would be, it was easy to go in and see for myself what other dogs, uh, siblings, and what, what other progeny had been produced off of my, the dogs that I was interested in. It goes another one. Well, no, I mean, at that time, This dog, Dapper Boella, Leo Fuel, that was like a notorious breeding, produced some of the nicest dogs. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna show you this example here. Now they call this dog Dapper Hitler. They, this dog, I didn't really think that he was that good. I mean, I don't like when this how this back leg is they use this dog heavily he produced quite a bit but you see that the, he was um we're gonna get back to this name too he was heavily used based off of all of the you know different kennels you can't see the drop down menu that i'm i'm selecting but if you click the drop down menu you will see a lot of different names so we came up with, let's get off this dog. Let's get on, let's keep, keep, let it continue. As I see, well, I've been running for 27 minutes already. But and that, we haven't even really got into the, to the halfway point. So I want to show you guys some of my other pedigrees that were significant. Now, so how did I get to this dog? I'll show you. So when I came down to Columbus, I picked up Greet, which was this female right here. That's at my yard. She was not that big, uh, but I knew that based off the pedigree, she was going to be a good dog to, for, for breeding. My boy down there had a uh, man that that was the dog that he had just imported. And when I was there, I saw him. So, I mean, this dog was super duper impressive. I think he paid like $20,000 for this dog at that time. Man, that Spitzberg man, that I'm not sure if y'all have ever seen the dog, but let me let me see if I can find. Yeah, this is him right here. Spitzberg man, that I saw this dog in the in the flesh. This must be him when he was just like a little baby puppy, because this dog was was something out of a movie. I mean, he was like one of those dogs that. None of these pictures 
is accurate. None of these pictures are accurate. And um, he ended up here, but I had to go back and do some research on him. I mean, I was dropped dead. I was floored when I saw the dog. I couldn't believe it. So what do you do when you see a dog that you like? You go to the database, you research the dog, and you find out more about how is he bred? What was, how did they make such a fine specimen? And that's just something that, uh, because one thing that I noticed with boar balls is you have to be very careful about the dog that you use for your breedings because it only takes one bad dog or one dog. I see some people would use a dog. It seemed like maybe they had a favorite. They liked the dog for whatever reason. And that's really how a dog should be bred. You should have something that you like about the dog, despite how he looks. Some of those dogs, though, should not have been bred. Some of those dogs, you know, you got to you gotta be, you need to, Be strict with your selection. Okay. So, wow. No wonder I like this dog so much. It's off of Korma Bucks. It's a Korma Bucks granddaughter, son. Bred to who? Spitzberg Molly. So let's let's uh dive into this pedigree. Spitzberg Molly. Now I like to go down to the lot bottom line. The bot let's get to the bottom line of this. Eisterberg Gaga, Piona Molly, Dopper, Piona, Eisterberg, 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 Avanter. Let's see what this Avanter is made up of. Avanter, Lorena, Piona. And Piona goes back to this Dopper dog, Lorena Mack. We're very familiar with Lorena Mack. That was the first time that the organization changed their pedigree. So, I mean, their, their, their standard was, that was the second time they changed the standard. And that's another thing with this evolving standard. I don't really subscribe to the evolving standard. Hold on one second. Is that clear? I didn't even know that was on there. So I don't, I don't subscribe to, we're going to keep changing the rules that seems a little bit unfair. You're going to change the rules after everybody's been following these rules and breeding towards this same um, ideal. Now you're going to change up the ideal or how you score it. It seems a little bit bait and switchy. Is I mean, in my years, that's the term that I've learned that it applies to. This, you know, we're going to show you one product. And it's going to be nice and shiny and super clean. But then when you pull up to make your purchase, the actual product that I'm going to sell you is a little bit dusty. It's a little bit dingy. It's a little bit dirty. It's not the same product. I don't I just didn't like that idea that they did that. So let's get back into the business, though. The bottom line of Spitzber Molly is she's a combination of Eisterberg and Piona. If you get to this bottom line, Eisterberg, so Molly is one, two, three, 50% Eisterberg. And fifty percent, let's say thirty-seven and a half percent, Piona, twelve and a half percent, Dopper. Interesting. Very, very interesting. This breeding off of Spitzberg Molly produced so many notable dogs. You got to take, you got to take notice of this. I'm talking about dogs that are used in foundations for other kennels, right? You can see in 2009, Targets produced the litter. Cabaret also produced off of this dog, uh, uh, this breeding. Spitzberg used a Spitzberg Molly Cabaret Klein Bucks 
offspring. These dogs, I don't name any, and if y'all, I'm here to, you know, I'm not here to argue, but we can go back and forth and presenting facts. 99.9% .9 of all popular borbles today are going to have some combination of these dogs in their pedigree. And that's just the facts of it because these dogs were extremely impressive. And that made people seek them out for purchase. So my school of thought is I'm a producer. I am a person that is trying to, I'm not really a buy a seller or wait a minute. I'm not, I'm more of a seller than a buyer. I'm a producer. Now, I had, now from an early age, I understood that the means of acquiring things is in the ability to produce, right? Or something like that. Money is a means of acquiring things. But let's get back into this dog stuff. How can I produce this for myself? So I go to the appraisals. Oh, the appraisals and I meet, uh, which is a good, I don't, I like the idea of a lot of dog people coming together, bringing their best dogs to the, nothing is wrong with that, to the event. And then it's a, I, a chance for us to meet dogs that we maybe did not know existed. I met some really good, passionate dog people at some of the appraisals. So they do have their value for networking. But in terms of, I mean, so that's, I mean, that's, that's one of the best things about it. Wow. So how can I get this iceberg into my, where do I get this iceberg? I'll see a lot of these dogs don't have the iceberg in their bloodline. Now here's where it's going to get real juicy. I ended up going to the appraisal in Cleveland. Now these appraisals, they have them far, few and far in between, right? It's kind of the way for the South Africans to kind of govern the breed. That's was their premise for the design of this organization. They're coming over to authorize people to breed dogs. And at the appraisal, you have a person from South Africa, so quote unquote expert, and they're coming over to evaluate the dogs. I really wish that you could see this screen that I'm getting ready to show because it, it, it has the drop down menu. Maybe y'all can go look at it for yourself. You'll be able to compare, you know, how the dog scored. But so long story short, I'm at the appraisal. I meet this uh, brother uh, similar to myself, young, ambitious, urban. He's got a dog. You know, I go over and, uh, you know, I'm a politicking with all of the people that's there. Uh, introducing myself, checking out their dogs, showing my dog. I go up to the guy, I mean, and the lady that was doing the scoring, whoo, she was rough. Her name was Anna Me, Anna, Mar Anna Marie Pretorius or something to that effect. She is a person of the Bell Busk bloodline, and she wrote, actually, she wrote the book on Borbles. Believe this. this so this is a fundamental, I want y'all to remember this. This is the person that wrote the book on the borbles. She scored my man's dog. And I mean, she she was tearing dogs down. I don't think anybody scored uh, over an 80 that day. Uh, people were very disappointed. Uh, my guy had drove all the way from St. Louis to Cleveland with these dogs in tow. And, uh, you know, everybody's excited. They bringing their dogs in to share with other people. And then you get there to the appraisal. And what do they do? They're not welcoming you with open arms. They're not impressed with your dogs. They want to try to make you believe somehow your dog is inferior to their dogs from South Africa. That's my personal belief. I'm just, I'm just keeping it factual. So my boy, he's got this dog. And um, here's another thing. You're not supposed to... The people at the table are not supposed to indicate to the appraiser 
the dog's pedigree. This is supposed to be a non-biased evaluation, not based off of any type of previous relationships. It should be purely on the dog. My friend, I mean, he's uh so but I peeked at the table, they got all the pedigrees exposed. And I read the rules. I read the rules. The rules said that this was something that was forbidden. But I got a chance to pick at the pedigree, and I noticed, I'm gonna show you this. This was this was impressive. My man's had came, and that's what I like about the appraisals. People are going to bring their best dogs to the appraisal, um, you know, that believe in the system. They, My man's brought in some dogs. Mark was his name, STL Borbles. Y'all can go check him out. He's, his website is still valid. Um, was was bringing in. And see, what will happen is sometimes people will try to uh, discourage you from breeding. And I don't think that that's fair. I feel like we should help people do what they want to do as long as it's not going to hurt you. So, and that's just the type of person that I am. I would like rather arm you with the information or share information with you to make you have success. That's part of the premise for the shows. We want to help people make sound decisions and at the best, we want the people to have the best for themselves and for their dogs. So, I see the dog, it's a female dog, and it's, but I thought it was a male. Here she go, right here, Penny. I thought it was a male. This dog right here though, oh my goodness. She, you talking about impressive. This dog was really, truly impressive. Penny, had a big wide chest, neck, and in this, the eyes were intense. The body language said serious business, serious dog. Um, she was a pure Eisterberg female. And I'm looking at, you always go, to, let's get to the bottom line. Go to this bottom line. You see, Vedger 3, Eisterberg, Vedger 3, one, two, three times in mentioned in this dog's pedigree on the bottom line out of eight ancestors he's three that's 37.5 percent him 37.5 percent his blood okay what was he producing why would they breed so tight on a dog like this who is this guy come to find out he is one of the most prolific producers in the Eisterberg history Vegger three. These are facts. Anybody that has Eisterberg dogs, nine out of 10 times has this dog in their pedigree. Why? It's because of his production record. This dog is producing some of some, some very high value specimens. I went, um, I went to my, 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 I talked to, I had to get my, my guy introduce myself. Got his telephone number, bought the dog from him. You know, he was a very, very disappointed with the score. In fact, it had him to the point that he was ready to kind of like get away from the breeding. Nobody was happy with their scores that day. I wasn't happy with my score that day. In fact, I was the last person to get scored. And I had to have a talk. We're going to go back over to the, we'll go back over here to the pedigree so you can kind of see what happened. Um, At that time, because I didn't think that it was fair at all. I mean, my dog came in. This is we're talking about a direct import from South Africa, uh, how line bred on Corma Bucks, pedigree off of uh, I mean, one of some of the best dogs. She's off of uh, Corma Bucks, Ronard Martins. Look at this, they tried to rank first of all. I was the last person to get scored. Out everybody, it's a long process. It takes about 45 minutes per dog, 20 to 45 minutes. 13 people were there ahead of me. I was the last person to get scored. Me and uh lady immediately 
she tried to disqualify my dog. My dog is there pregnant, mind you, with 12, 16 puppies. She's had 16 puppies. She had them seven days after the appraisal. She had a cone, you know, cone shaped head. She had got into it with uh, some of our other dogs and they had jumped on her head and pulled it apart. She had a split. The dog had, had went through some rough times prior to her going to the appraisal. But she was in good shape. She was healthy. The lady, Anna Marie, tried to disqualify my dog based off the height. So I'm like, wait a minute. You can't. How are you going to disqualify my dog off the height? You don't even have a measuring stick. You don't know how tall she is. And you ain't been measuring dogs all day. So you ain't going to start measuring dogs now. She said, okay, you fair. That's fair enough. I'll go ahead. I mean, she's looking around. It's just me and her there. She goes ahead and scores the dog. Now I'm thinking to myself, the fix is in. I see her take out the red pen and she's marking the dog down, marking all of this scores red. She, gonna, she couldn't disqualify her on the height. So she going, you know, I said, okay, you're going to disqualify my dog. Give me my money back. No, I'll go ahead and score the dog. She scores the dog. And then she's going to fail my dog off of points. So one thing that I learned is to stand up for myself. I'm not going to go out without some type of resistance i mean it's that's just me i told the lady do you mind if i have a look at the score sheet i told her and she said sure we we both it's a clipboard she's looking at the clipboard i'm looking at the clipboard i couldn't see that good so i kind of grabbed it and took possession of it i couldn't see so i could see better and i told her i don't agree with this you got to change it because my it was the lips was the and I'll never forget this. My dog's mouth was tight, didn't have any dewlap around the this. I said, you're gonna have to change that. I mean, this be fair to the dog. I'm all about fairness and justice. The dog's lips were she she had to admit to herself, you're right. She had changed the score and initialed it. Reason that I make this a point. Is because at that time, a 75.0 was the minimum score that your dog had to achieve in order to qualify as a breeding dog. And this is purely based off of the way that the dog looks. Okay. So my dog, because I argued that point, she scored a point three percentage points up from a 74.9 to a 75.2 and passed. The lady came up to me and said, I don't advise you to breed this dog anymore. And I don't understand why she came up to me and said that. But later I kind of came up with my own conclusions. But we're talking about a dog line bred off of one of the most prolific producers in the breed. The dog got a pass and score. I don't see no reason why not to pass. Why not to continue to breed it? Lo and behold, my little 75.2 dog, she produced my boy machine gun. And not only him, I'll go to my, uh, let's let's take a look. Let's go over to my YouTube. I'll show y'all some of my young dogs. I'll show you some of my dogs when I was a boy. Uh, I mean, well, never, never was a boy, but you can see um, some of my original dogs. Oops, not that. Never, never was a boy. You can see some of my original dogs that, uh, hold on one second. Let me, let me go back to the, back in the day. And I'll show you his, 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 this litter. I slept on the floor with these puppies. I slept on the floor with these puppies. I didn't know very much at all. I didn't have people around me to mentor me. I reached out to others in the community and I was I was off on my own. And that's kind of why I do what I do now, because had I had 
a mentor or had I had someone there um, to kind of walk me through my first litter, I probably could have saved I only out of uh, 16 puppies. I ended up with six. I mean, but I was there, though. I I, I mean, I must have stayed up uh, two days. She had so many puppies. I wasn't prepared. I mean, it was puppies everywhere. But then again, it was a green flag. I realized something about my girl. She's this dog. It's not my boy's dog that had the problem. It, that wasn't the problem. There we go. There goes another one of my first pups. Okay, I'm recording. Another one of my first dogs. Of my first litter. And that's me back in the day. The dog, though, and I didn't know how to dock tails. This is Samson out that same litter. And I mean, look, he, he got a motor skills. He got he got drive. He looking, he ready to run. The YouTube then came a long way. That's me back in the day, though. I mean, that's one of the first dogs. I feel like that's one. That's an impressive warble. I feel like that he and I mean, I feel like today that's not Mo. That's not the dog that scored the highest score grid in the USA. That's not him. That's his brother. But um, it's just consistency. I, I, I showed the video to show the consistency of the bloodlines and they had, you know, ability to produce. I didn't, I wanted, you know, I don't look at the chest on that boy. I didn't see any reason why not to breed the dogs after looking at that, after looking at that. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a, look at this, look at the movement. This is the foundation of our bloodlines right here. All of our dogs carry some of this same genetic material. And See, that was 12. That dog was born in 07. And this is 2021. That's 15 years ago. That's 14 years ago. That dog was born 14 years ago. And I think that he rivals any of the other dogs. I think he rivals in dogs out here today. That's my personal opinion and i'm not talking down on nobody's dogs i'm only stating what i believe to be facts so i hope that y'all able to walk away with something from this today y'all got um that's part of the reason why it's hard for me to really get into the breeding um the dog organizations i feel like they just don't have as much to offer and I, I know for a fact that they biased and biased, I mean, towards they have a preference of dogs and those are the dogs that they're going to score higher. And it's not based off of the dog's true value. And being in, in being fair, the best dogs should score the highest. Regardless of who bred them, um, when I went and scored Mo for that's the dog machine gun, I bring him back up. Let me get y'all a picture of him. When I went and got Mo scored, he scored a, a 89.9, which was high. This is Mo. This is the dog that they said that a uh, puppy off of the dog that they said that I shouldn't be breeding anymore. That's him. Why would I not continue to breed the dog if she able to produce that kind of that kind of quality? So when I went and got him scored, remember that I had said that, and I don't want to really get off into too much of um, social issues because this is about dogs, but that comes into play even in dogs. I didn't. I felt like I was being stereotype you know some of the names and stuff that people call me but that's cool because that's i was born hated and i'm cool with that it is actually a source of fuel it's a source of motivation it inspires me to do better it inspires me to show with my actions that you're wrong when you make those type of assumptions about a person without getting to know them without when you prejudge a person. So I kind of was trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. 
they had named this dog Hitler. I was kind of offended by that. You know, then, then they, and then they holding this dog in a high regard, which is a little offensive to me. So at the time when I had went and got my dog a, a, a praise, you had to let the people know from prior to you getting your dog scored. You know, you had to send in your pedigree and then you send in the dog's names. Now, the lady at the time in charge of the SABT was the organization was Shirley, Shirley Hackler. Shirley Hackler is in charge of the NABA now. And what they do is you have to get eight or nine dogs together. And it's really extremely profitable for the South Africans. They are charging uh, $200 for the score. And they're taking that money back over to South Africa, where it's 13 times a dollar, 13 times a dollar for every dollar. So you figure they're charging $2,600 for an appraisal. You got eight dogs to every venue. Do the math. That's eight times 2,500 is what? 20,000. So they figure that they stand to, if they just take half, if they take for the bringing the appraisal over, it's half. They only take, they're walking away with half. Still, we talking, let's say the appraisal tour is eight stops, 20,000 to stop. You're you walking away with 80,000 for a two weeks worth of work. So it's very lucrative. As well as it's very lucrative, as well as um, I guess valuable to the breed. Pardon me for one moment, I'll be right. I'm hey, get down, get down. All right, you can stay up here. So, Shirley Hackler, Shirley Hackler. I had to call in and let them know that I was going to be at this tour. I really wanted to have the tour. I wanted to be the host because in my experience, the host always walked away with the highest scores. So, I, hey, y'all come on down to let me be the host and let me have a show. I got enough. If it needs eight dogs, I got eight dogs of my own. So, hey, of course, for whatever reason, I wasn't qualified to host my own show. So that I had to let the people know that I was coming down to Columbus. You know, they had to have a score in a appraisal in Ohio. This it was so many dogs in Ohio. It's a valuable stock. Remember, they're taking this back over to South Africa, uh $20,000 for every stop that they make. So they got to do Ohio. Ohio was one of the highest populations of borbles in the country. I go down to Columbus. Well, I had to call in. I'm on the phone with Shirley Hackler. She's going over my pedigree or the dogs. And this was when I had, I let her know which dogs I was bringing to the appraisal. I had Remy. Um, I had a machine gun, which was Mo. And um, so the dogs, they were named off of, uh, you know, I kind of wanted them to have powerful names. So I had... Uh, Macho Big, which is a dog off of, you know, it's related to some other dogs. I named one of 187 Death Row. I'll show you the pedigree. It's off of Penny. And I don't know if you know what a Death Row is, but that's the move that the alligator makes when he shakes the, uh, you know, the alligator is shaking up the um, his prey. She wanted, she had questioned me though, and this this is always something that. You know, in my mind, you know, who are you to question me? You don't understand? If we don't have a conversation, that's an exchange of information. You're going to have to provide some information. Also, she wanted to know why did I choose to name my dog Gina Six? And I just wanted to kind of like, I was being political at the time. But I felt like this is my answer for dogs named Hitler. You know what I'm saying? A, G, a dog named Gina Six. And this is Gina Six is not uh, about, uh, and I don't want to really get off into. I'm not going to go too far into this, but it's Gina Six was six young African American males that had got went to prison for uh, somebody assaulting a person about a noose. The point was 
if this is about dogs, why are you questioning me about my name that I chose to name my dog, bringing them to the appraisal? She wanted to know, why did I choose the name? Why did I choose to name my dog that? And I felt like, listen, Shirley Hackler, that's none of your business. No, no, no offense. None, no offense. But it's none of your business. I can name the dog as I please. Just like these dudes, uh, just like these dudes that's naming their dogs what they choose to see fit. That's why I name my dog. When I get to the appraisal, though. I get to the appraisal. She tells the appraiser as uh, he's scoring my dog that I was a bad boy. A bad boy? First of all, lady, who you calling boy? Ain't no boy, ain't no boy here. I was young already. I was still not a boy. So I did this is inappropriate. It's inappropriate, and I didn't feel like uh, it was warranted. Yeah, I didn't even see the comments. I just got hit. My dog, um, he would not allow the dog to get his full credit. He had to not. He knocked him down for whatever he said in his loin. I was so disappointed. And I'll show you the pictures again. Uh, matter of fact, let's go over the actual day of the appraisal. And he said that the loin was uh, too lean. I guess they want the dogs to have these big stomachs, you know, real big stomachs. And I just, my dogs have never had that. I don't, I, I skip a day before I let them have that. So I just, that was the last appraisal that I took my dogs to. Because I felt like that was, uh, it's just too much. I try to stay away from situations that are not going to be um, productive. And I can see that this situation is can, can, can be counterproductive. It could be actually destructive because you're not going to, my, you know, it's my family. This You don't talk about my children. So that that's that's kind of uh that's kind of where I'm at with it. I didn't I didn't subscribe to that anymore. I started uh register with the AKC who was um they came out shortly after that. They started accepting foundation stock. So it was easier. They don't have to just $25 to register. That $250 is out the door and then I don't have to drive across the country. To make it to the uh, to the to the appraisal, and only to have my dog, you know, somebody tell me that my dog is in somehow inferior, when I know better to myself. So I'll show you that. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to show y'all the actual day, and you can maybe maybe it's only a small clip. Well, we'll catch up with that next time. I hope that y'all find this informative and you walk away with uh, something that you can learn, something of value. Um, I appreciate y'all for watching and supporting every last person that's been on the live. I really appreciate you. Tune in. I can't wait. We're going to be doing this more often. If you got comments leave or suggestions, you can leave them in the comments. Right now, if you haven't subscribed already, I think that you should because there's got some valuable information here that we, we're going to keep it factual. We're going to have some special guests. We're going to try to make it informative and entertaining and something that is of value, not just looking at pictures. Um, all right, y'all. So... I really appreciate y'all. We out. No rush, go on, you dumb. Back and forth, push and shove. Make your peace and love turn to peace and gloves. Now you got a deal right now. No rush, go on, you dumb. Back and forth, push and shove. Make your peace and love turn to peace and Now you got a deal right now. Old gang, old man, old school, young jam.
Well, hey, you know what I forgot? I could. Would y'all like to see the puppies? Anybody? For sure. That boy going. That's one of my boys there. All right. I tell you what, I'll come back because I forgot that this is not broadcasting off my phone. This is off my off my webcam. So we'll come tune in tomorrow, y'all. I appreciate y'all for watching. Thanks. Thanks again. No rush, go on, you dumb. Back and forth, push and shove. Make your peace and love turn to peace and gloves. Now you got a deal run up. No rush, go on, you dumb. Back and forth, push and shove.